Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the scriptures, for these stories about Jesus and what they teach us about you and about your heart and your love for us. Lord, meet us in this passage this morning. Help us to hear it, to understand it, and apply it to our lives. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's Thanksgiving week, and God has blessed us. He always blesses us, whether we recognize it or not. Sadly, some people take his blessings and run, and other people grumble that uh, the blessings somehow fell short, and they had greater expectations of their blessings. It reminds me of a couple of stories. The first one is the lady who on Thanksgiving morning called uh, the Butterball Turkey Hotline, and she says, I've got a 22-pound bird. <clears throat> How long will it take to cook? The operator, consulting a chart, said, just a minute, to which the lady replied, thank you very much, and hung up. <laughs> I don't want to have Thanksgiving at her house. Uh, the second one is that there's this place in Mexico where there are hot and cold running springs side by side. And so the, the folks who live there, the villagers, take their laundry out and they boil it in the hot water and then they rinse it out in the cold water. And a tourist observing this procedure said to the tour guide, I'm sure that those folks are really happy with Mother Nature. She's provided everything they need for their laundry. To which he replied, no, senor, I'm sorry, but they grumble because there's no soap. That's the way human beings are. We'll see a little bit of that in our passage of scripture this morning. Jesus, this is Luke's gospel, has set his face like flint. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to the Passover. He himself will be the Paschal lamb. He is going to give his life. He won't be deterred from his mission, and so he is on his way. He's passing from Galilee through Samaria, and he's at that border area where he encounters 10 lepers. Lepers are outcasts. They are instructed by the law that they have to keep a certain distance between them, they, and those who are healthy. Um, Leviticus chapter 13 and Numbers chapter 5, they've got to keep some distance between them and healthy people. Um, and so they heard about Jesus, and as they huddle, their skin is de destroyed, it's scaly, it's gross, their fingers are falling off, their ears, their noses, any extremities from their bodies, they're hideous to look at. Um, people don't want to deal with lepers, so they keep them and drive them away. Um, even like sheep and wolves will huddle together at a high spot in the midst of a flood, because of their extremity, because of their pain, it doesn't matter whether you're a Samaritan or whether you're a Jew, what you share in common is greater than what keeps you apart from one another, and what they share in common is this dreadful, incurable disease. So they are without hope, they were, are without any encouragement at all, until they hear that Jesus is passing by. And Jesus has a reputation. This is the end of his earthly ministry. This is three years that he has been teaching and he has been healing and he has been performing miracles. And they hope beyond hope that he will stop and take time for them. And so our outline this morning is like last week. I've got four points for you. And if you want to write them down, you can. And you can follow along with me. The first one is the cry of the lepers. The second one is the healing of the obedient. The third is the return of the thankful. I knew that. And, and the fourth one is Jesus' commentary on the passing scene, on the situation. It's his reaction to what has taken place in these short verses. So the first is the cry of the lepers. The lepers are um, also, their voice box has been destroyed by the disease. So they're able to communicate, but it's a hoarse croaking whisper that they use, and yet they are crying out with all of their strength and with all of their might. They want Jesus to do something for them. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. Jews and Samaritans have no dealings. The Samaritans uh, were left behind, and they intermingled with the people uh, that, that were left there. The Jews had been taken off into exile. They stayed together in exile. They returned together in exile. The Jews looked down on the Samaritans as half-breeds. They mudbloods. If you watch Harry Potter, that's how they viewed them. They were trash. You don't have anything to do with them. Um, and that was the attitude. So Jesus is passing through this area where they are at that border. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers. Again, they've heard something about Jesus. They've heard that he cares about people, that he helps people. 
People who are beaten down by other people, people who are beaten down by circumstances and by life, they don't cry out for help. They cry out for mercy, and that's what the lepers do. They have no expectation that anybody's going to do anything for them. People are afraid of them. They throw rocks at them if they get too close to drive them away. This is their expectation, and yet they've heard that Jesus is different. And Jesus is different. When he sees human need, when he sees people living lives less than abundantly that they were created to live, then Jesus steps forward and Jesus acts. And so, and as Jesus entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. They are honoring the law. They are doing what they are instructed to do, and they lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master. Well, they know something about Jesus. That word master is epistata. In the Greek, it is chief commander. Jesus, commander-in-chief over life and over disease. Commander-in-chief is what they call Jesus, epistata. Jesus, master. They want something from Jesus. They uh, refer to him with respect, and they call out, have mercy on us. They want their circumstances to change. They want to be able to be reintegrated into society. They want to go home to their families. They have no hope that this is likely to happen. And yet, here is Jesus, and he's healed others. Perhaps he will have mercy on us. Perhaps he will heal us. And when he saw them, it's not when he heard them. They're screaming at the top of their lungs as best they are able to do. And when he saw them, Jesus doesn't take care of people from a distance. Jesus doesn't keep people at arm's length. He goes toward the problem, not away from the problem. He hears this cry, this, this horse croaking, and he moves toward it. And when he saw them, they were able to see him. They could see his face. They could see his love. They could see his compassion. They could believe that Jesus would have mercy on them. Here is this healer, this teacher that they've heard so much about, and he comes toward, nobody comes toward a leper. They run away from lepers. And here is Jesus coming toward this group of lepers. They can't get over it. And Jesus says to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. We have a lot of people who say that the Old Testament isn't for us and it doesn't apply to us. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. Jesus came to fulfill the law. And Jesus shows respect and he honors the law by requiring the lepers, Leviticus chapter 14, to do what the law required. And when they have received a healing, to go to Jerusalem, show themselves to the priests, to be reintegrated into society, and there's a procedure that they have to follow. Jesus honors the procedure. Go and show yourselves to the priest. Now, there is a command. He hasn't done anything yet. Why would a leper who is disfigured and gross go to Jerusalem, joining the pilgrims on the way to Jerusalem for the Passover? Why would they put themselves in proximity to other people? Why would they put themselves out They've got quite a journey left ahead of them to get to Jerusalem. And as of yet, there's no evidence that Jesus has done or will do anything. Go show yourselves to the priest. Their fingers are still off or gnarled. Their noses have fallen off. They're deformed. They're, they're scaly. They, they have no evidence of this. You remember the definition of faith in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11.1. 1. It is the assurance of things hoped for. It is the conviction of things not seen. Jesus calls them out and, and calls out an incipient faith. He's requiring them to do something to demonstrate their faith. It is the assurance of things hoped for. What is their hope against hope? That they might receive mercy, that they might experience healing. It's the assurance of hope, and it is the conviction of things not seen. Well, clearly in their bodies, as they look at one another, no change has taken place. Nothing is different. So first... The lepers cry. They've brought Jesus to themselves. Second, the healing of the obedient. They obeyed this command even when there was no evidence to support it. Does Jesus do that in your life? Does he tell you to do things that in worldly terms make no sense at all? And is he waiting for you to step out in faith and to do what he commanded you to do? Whether you're ready to do it or not, whether you see any evidence that it'll make any difference or not, it didn't seem to make any sense. It didn't seem to make any difference to these lepers. But what do they have to lose? 
They can't get any worse. Well, they can get worse. It'll eventually kill them. But, but they, can, they can at least do what Jesus said. And so in obedience... And they obeyed, where am I, verse 14, the second half, and as they went, they were cleansed. They're looking at one another, and they're getting better. And their skin is less scaly and less red and less inflamed, and the deformities are beginning to reverse themselves. They feel themselves gaining strength as they are making their way toward Jerusalem. They have obeyed. And it's when we obey that we receive God's blessings. When, he, when we do the things that he tells us to do is when we receive God's blessings. And so they obeyed, and they're on their way. And as they are going, they experience this drastic change. It is their obedience that has brought healing. It is their incipient faith. This morning is one of our quarterly healing services. The same Jesus that we're reading about in this passage of Scripture is the same Jesus who promises us where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. Same Jesus that has mercy and compassion for these lepers has mercy and compassion on his people. And so just as he said to them, go and show yourself, um, we are going to ask you to come forward. And in the same way, it's an opportunity for you to go in obedience to his call on you to receive grace, to receive mercy. And then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. Luke is a doctor, Luke the physician, and he notes the change in that hoarse croak now has become a loud voice. This man is making an utter spectacle of himself. He was a leper, and now he is not. All the evidence of it has disappeared from his body, and he stops and takes note of that and starts screaming at the top of his lungs, praise and thanksgiving. Are we moved by the praise of God and the thanksgiving to God for his many blessings? Or, or do we just take them and go? The ten, or the nine, they wanted a change in their health. They wanted a change in their circumstances. They wanted a blessing for the blessing's sake. They didn't care about the giver. All they cared about was the gift. They wanted what they wanted, and they received what they wanted, and they went on to live their lives without any reference to Jesus, without any reference to God. They got what they wanted. Do you treat God's blessings in the same way? You've got yours. You've got a nice house. You've got nice clothes. You've got a roof over your head. You've got all of your needs provided for. You know where those came from? God. They are his blessings. They come to you from his fatherly hand. You wouldn't have been able to make a living. You wouldn't have a retirement account unless God had gifted you with certain abilities and certain talents. And you were able to do those things because of what God has done for you. And do you acknowledge that? Do you give thanks to God? This week is Thanksgiving. At least once a year, we set aside a day to say thank you to God for those blessings and others, for your health and for your welfare. Take this opportunity to be like that one leper who recognized what God had done for him. And it wasn't sufficient to take the blessing and run, but he wanted to say thank you. He wanted to acknowledge what it was that God had done for him. And he fell on his face. Is it ever wrong to give, say thank you? No. Is it ever wrong to praise God, to worship God? No. Was he being disobedient? Jesus said, go and show yourself to the priest. When he turned around and came back to Jesus, was he afflicted again with leprosy? No. It is always appropriate to worship. It's always appropriate to praise. It is always appropriate to give thanks. Paul says in Romans 1, the wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and godlessness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. For although they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give him thanks. The human condition is an ungrateful heart. We think we're entitled. We think we are owed. And when we don't get what we want, then we get angry. That's not the condition of this leper. His gratefulness, his thanksgiving, enabled God to do a further work, not just in the cure, but in the healing. See, when we come to God, what, what do we want? We want the cure. That's what the nine got. God, change my circumstances, make things better, make my life easier, return to me my health. And they got what they asked for. They got a cure, but they weren't healed. 
The one who turned back, the one who acknowledged God and, and his goodness is the one who experienced shalom, peace, wholeness, completeness. The others got what they wanted, but they didn't get the wholeness, the completeness. And so he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And now he was a Samaritan. The other nine were Jews, probably. And off they went. They, didn't, they, didn't, they were God's chosen people. They were owed this healing. We have people that have that same attitude. These were God's people who don't honor God, who don't worship God, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And who comes back? A pagan, a heathen, a Samaritan, a goyim, a dirty dog, as the Jews called them back in the day. That's the one who acknowledges what it is that God had done for him. When we have an expectation that we're owed something, we're chronically disappointed. When God meets us in his kindness and grace and mercy, that's when we receive those blessings that we would otherwise miss. And this man didn't miss those blessings. He built an altar of praise and thanksgiving at the feet of Jesus. Jesus first went toward him because he was unclean. Now that he's clean, he can come toward Jesus. And nobody stopped him. And he came all the way to Jesus, giving him praise and giving him thanks and acknowledging what it was that God had done for him. We've heard the lepers cry. We've seen the healing that the obedient received. We've seen the return of the thankful. Now what's Jesus' commentary on all that has taken place? Verse 18, he asks three questions. Was no one found to return and give praise to God? I'm sorry, were not 10 cleansed? Do you hear the sadness in Jesus' voice? He blesses us and we don't even acknowledge it. He does for us and we don't show our thanks or our praise. We don't even take a moment to bow our heads and just say, thank you, Jesus, for the little things. We're not 10 cleansed. Where are the other nine? Jesus' expectation is when God does something for you, that you acknowledge it, that it makes sense to you to say thank you to God for his blessings to you, and he's dismayed that the nine went away. Years ago, there was a radio program on the radio called uh, The Job Fair of the Air. I like the alliteration. And they helped 2,500 people while it was on the radio to get jobs. And the host of that program was asked once, how many people responded and said thank you? Ten. 2,500 people's lives were changed. They were able to get jobs because of the ministry of this job fair of the air, and only 10 could be bothered to send a thank you note. Um, that's what Jesus is commenting on. There's no acknowledgement of God's goodness, his grace, his mercy. What's your concept of God? Is God a God of grace? Is he a God of mercy? And when he extends that to you, do you say thank you? The first question is, were there not, not uh, ten cleansed? Where are the nine? The next question is, was there no one found to return to give praise to God except this foreigner? See, they're God's chosen people. They had a, a requirement. They, they believed that God owed them this healing in some manner, shape, or form. So they got what they wanted and off they went. Who comes back? The outcast. The one who is shunned. The one who's rejected. Now he'll return to being shunned and rejected socially because he's a Samaritan, not because of his leprosy. But that doesn't matter. He's giving praise. He's giving thanks to God for what God has done for him. Was no one found except this foreigner? And again, Jesus is expressing dismay at God's people. So he says to that man, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you shalom. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you complete. You received the cure that you wanted. Your leprosy is gone. And now receive a healing. Mind, body, and spirit. Be brought back into right relationship with God. The man understood that it was God that healed him. He was giving thanks and praise to God. And he understood that Jesus was the means of that. And until that moment, he hadn't understood that God and Jesus were one and the same. And now he does. And now you are made well, now you are whole, now you have the whole package, shalom. You receive all of what God has for you. And of the ten, only the one received that word from Jesus, that his faith had made him complete, his faith had made him whole. 
He'll die. His body will molder in the grave, but because he has been changed and he has encountered Jesus Christ and he has faith in Jesus Christ, he will live eternally and the other nine will perish in their unbelief. This Thanksgiving week, I hope that we will take time and acknowledge what it is that God has done for us. And again, on this morning, it's a healing service. We're going to now do what our Bibles tell us. This is the book of James, chapter 5. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him give praise. If you've got something to praise God about. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. It's an opportunity for you to come before the Lord and to give praise. It's to come and to confess sin. It's come and to ask and to seek healing. And so we're simply going to do what the scriptures command us to do.